Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my name is Rick Altman. I'm the District 31 Vice President for the United Mine Workers of America. I have the honor and the privilege today to come to you via social media. Today, we are doing our number nine memorial service. It's with a heavy heart that I have to do it this way. But President Roberts and myself, we believe the safety of our miners are paramount, and we believe the safety of the number nine service is paramount. And you as family, we wish to keep you as safe as what we can conceivably keep you. So therefore, we are doing it via social media. I'd like to thank my staff, Adam Fry, Mike Philippi, Tommy McGeary, Gloria Sandy, Glenn Moran, and Jill Dilley. They have worked very hard through this situation and they are staying safe and we are still working with the members who call and need assistance. Without them, it would be a very hard situation. I thank them very much. 52 years ago, there was a tragic explosion. It rocked the hills of Marion County. But not only did it rock the hills of Marion County, but the widows, the children, the grandparents, they stormed Washington, D.C. And because of that, it invoked change in this country, in this industry. So when you go underground or your family member goes underground, remember who you have to thank. They have fought and they still fight for the safety of each and every miner that goes underground. And for that, I thank them. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring up Sharon Clellan. Sharon has sang the national anthem for here for many years. She was only five years old when their father, David Corro, so tragically taken into the, the explosion. Please help me welcome Sharon to the podium singing the national anthem. Sharon. At this time for the Pledge of Allegiance, we always had our brother and our friend, Larry Mazin. Larry has passed. At this time, it is with great honor and a privilege that for today, we pass that torch to his son, Vice President of District 2 United Mine Workers, Chuck Neisel. So please welcome Chuck Neisel for the pledge. Chuck. Good morning, brothers and sisters. In the honor of the late Larry Neisel, I will be doing the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. Please rise and address the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to introduce Reverend Richard Bowyer. In November of 1968, he served eight days and nights as a chaplain coordinator at the site of the Farmington No. 9 mine explosion. He was the lead pastor and consoling the families of the fallen mine. And to this day, Reverend Bowie has missed two of these ceremonies. Please 
welcome Reverend Richard Moyer. It's always a privilege and an honor to participate in this memorial to the 78 men who died in the Farmington Number no. 9 disaster. I consider the opportunity to be a part of this one of the highlights and most important parts of the ministry in which I've been engaged. I was blessed with the opportunity to be called because I was a part of the Board of Directors of the Fairmont Clinic to become the chaplain coordinator during eight days and nights on the scene of the uh, horrible disaster. I was able to be in touch with many of the families, not only during that time, but some of them in the years intervening. This year is uh, particularly unusual. It's difficult because we're doing this in a totally different format. At least we're not getting the snow and wind that we've had on some of the occasions, but we're also missing the beautiful sunshine on some of the days that we've had. The thing that bothers me most, I think, this year is that with all of the conflict and confusion around the election and the suffering many people have and the frustrations caused by the COVID-19, many people across our area and across the country and the world have other things on their mind and are not remembering this significant and important event. But those of the families of those who died, and those of us who are close and working <clears throat> in the union and in other ways, never forget. And so we are gathered once again to remember these men and what their deaths have meant to the safety of coal mining ever since. May we pray. Our gracious and merciful God, we come before you this day, first of all, with grateful hearts for the lives of these men who were lost and for the contribution which their deaths have made to the safety of mining since that tragic event. We pray your blessings now upon the families, the loved ones, as well as the survivors of that day and upon all who continue to work in the cause of safety for miners and for people in other areas of work. We remember our Father that there are those <clears throat> in elected positions who seem to want to roll back actions and policies and practices that result in safety to miners. And we know that it would be well if their minds were changed but realize it's their hearts that need to be changed. And so we ask for your wisdom and direction upon those who hold those views. Continue to bless these families, keep them strong in your care, give them comfort and grace and peace, and continue to guide and direct all that we do, that it might bring safety and health and wellness to all involved in the mining industry. For we ask it in your name and for your sake, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to introduce the next speaker. Levi Allen is the Secretary Treasurer of the United Mine Workers of America. Levi is third generation coal miner. His father, John, worked at the, the McElroy Coal Company, who I had the privilege of working with. Levi was my recording secretary. He has quickly risen through the ranks. Levi is a hard worker, and he stands up for workers' rights all over the country, all over the world. So please, at this time, it is truly an honor for me to welcome the next speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary Treasurer Levi Allen. I wanna take the opportunity to thank Rick for the introduction. You know, when I, when I first started at McElroy 13 years ago, Rick came to me, uh, first day, it was first day. You know, Alan Pooch was one of the first people that I met whenever I went to mine. Rick was one of the uh, second people that I met right after I met the lamp man. Uh, and he came up to me and he asked me who my dad was. I uh, told him it was John Levinsky, uh, and he said, Stanley, you know, he and Jeff Beck always referred to my dad as Stanley, uh, he, and he said, look, if you ever need anything, if you're ever in a tight spot, if you're if you're ever worried about something or confused about anything, you can always come to me, and I'll do everything I can to help, and you know what, Rick's never forgotten that promise, and you know, I'm aware of the fact that I wouldn't be where I am today without the friendship and it, it, you know the compassion that Rick Altman has shown me. So uh, you know I want to sincerely thank Rick for the introduction. He's been with me a long time, and I think you know we have to keep 
with that tradition, you know, Rick never forgot his promise to help take care of me and help me get out of that mine safely to my family every day. And unfortunately, the Farmington miners did not have that same luxury. They didn't have that same luxury because things weren't the same at that point in time. Uh, there was no enforcement. There was no uh, right to fight your way out of an unsafe situation. Uh, and, you know, everything changed. And it changed because of a medium just like this. And I know this is strange right now because generally we would be gathered in congregation around the monument there outside of, uh, you know, where Farmington, uh, where the shaft was and up, uh, up that hollow. And it would be cold uh, and we'd all be, uh, you know, there kind of shivering and standing on that hollowed ground and you feel a, a, a presence, you feel a heaviness uh, and a connectedness to those miners when you stand there. But I think what we really need to embrace right now is uh, expanding our congregation, expanding it outside of that hollow and, and, and realizing that it's all hallowed ground. It's all hallowed ground and we're gonna have to fight to defend every single part of, of, of this world uh, from, from people who want to walk back mind, safety, and health. Uh, you know, I think about, you know, uh, you know, my friend Carl, who had a, had a close call at the mine where, where he almost died. Uh, you know, my friend Jeff, who had a close call at the mine where he almost died. And, you know, there are still tragedies that happen you know, I think about, you know, investigating, you know, a fatality for a 21 year old man who passed away at my mind, you know, at the end of last year, you know, since we last met. And, you know, we still have room for improvement. But as long as we remember the Farmington miners and our promise to never forget the sacrifice that they made uh, and, and remember how much pain and how much anguish their families went through knowing the dad was never gonna come home again, how much pain these communities went through knowing that one of their heroes was never gonna walk down the street or show up in the, in the restaurant or in the little shop in town again. Uh, you know, as long as we recognize that we never want anyone to go through that again and love each each other uh, as as he loved us you know that that is the point that is the purpose and I do want to remark you know uh, lost lost a friend Larry Nizel uh, member of local union 1570 president of that local union and one of the things that I remember every single time I ever went to the Farmington service um, Larry was involved in in the salute and the gun salute uh, and um, he gave me a casing for the very first time that, that I went. And, uh, you know, I, I, I gave that casing uh, to his son, Chuck, uh, at Larry's service. And, and, you know, Larry was buried with that casing. And I think, you know, that uh, I really look at that and I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to do that. And I want to thank, uh, you know, District 2 Vice President Chuck Nizel for giving me the opportunity to do that, because I think, you know, that's sort of returning to the earth, something that's in memorial of the Farmington miners and, uh, you know, the promises never forget uh, and to do everything we can to give back those who gave their all. And I appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate the Farmington miners and we're never moving backward. As long as I'm a part of this union, we'll always remember and uh, thank you all. God bless you. God bless the Farmington miners. And hopefully as we get through this pandemic, we can all see each other soon. But a pandemic, uh, personal issues, professional issues, industry problems, nothing can make us walk backward from remembering the Farmington miners because we are all alive today, those who toiled in the mines after the fact because of the sacrifice they made. Thank you so much. God bless you. I hope to see you all soon. I get really one of the greatest honors that could ever be bestowed upon me. And I don't get this honor very often, but I get to introduce our keynote speaker and that would be President Cecil Roberts. Cecil Roberts is a man devoted to all working people in America. Cecil Roberts is devoted to the miners that go underground. He has helped people throughout this country. Without his leadership and determination, I don't know where we'd be with our health care and pension. 
this man spends every working day and every working night on how to protect us, keep us safe, and keep us under his wing. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, it is the greatest honor for me to introduce to you the President of the United Mine Workers of America, Cecil E. Roberts. Please welcome President Roberts. Brothers and sisters, uh, we once again are approaching um, an anniversary of the 1968 Farmington disaster where 78 uh, of our brothers and sisters lost their lives in one of the most historic events, tragic events that ever occurred in mining. But it's also extremely important as to what happened after that. And we go there every year uh, to, to the site where this occurred and remember these men along with their families who come and over the years, we've done that almost without any interruption. But here we are uh, as the entire country has to deal with the coronavirus. And we find ourselves wearing masks in supermarkets and restaurants. I'm a West Virginia University football fan and we usually have 60,000 people in the stands. And now it's almost empty the stadium is when we play football um, and it's it's really disrupted our lives but we must we have to get this virus under control and let me say this one more time this is real uh, this isn't something somebody made up this is not the flu until we get this under control we're not going to be able to get our economy under control so this is something else we have to deal with. We're doing this virtually this year. Let me just say, I would much rather uh, once again be at the memorial itself doing this. I've spoken there almost every single year that we've been doing this, but we are coming together uh, to a virtual uh, memorial here to remember these miners who lost their lives. And let me just uh, remember somebody that's been there every single year uh, that we've done this. And that's my dear friend, Larry Nizel. Larry was an activist in our union. He was an activist in the Veterans of Foreign Wars. He uh, was there every year in the honor guard uh, from local union, excuse me, through from post uh, 9916. And he was a member of Local Union 1570, was past president, he was a former district board member. So this is the first year that we do this without Larry. But we've had to do this every year, remembering somebody that's played an active role in our union, active role in the service. And in many instances, the widows of minors have uh, over the years passed away. And I want to remember also those people who became activists almost overnight, um, mainly the widows from Farmington. I want you to think about this uh, and as we think about the contributions of women this year, particularly having a historic election where we elect the first woman as uh, vice president of our country. And I want you to think about these widows for them. When her husbands went out the door, within a matter of hours, a couple of things happened. One is they became the head of the household, which they did not plan to do. And what I mean by that, they had to figure out, well, how am I gonna feed these kids? And how, how are we gonna pay the rent? Uh, how are we gonna um, manage everything that's now in front of us? In addition to that, they took it upon themselves to start going to Washington, D.C. to make demands on the United States government and practicing democracy in its greatest form. We want justice for our loved ones here. We want some law passed or group of laws passed. So this doesn't happen to anybody else in the mining communities of the United States. And we've gone from 1890 
1968 without a single law on the federal books to protect workers. But because of their activism, because of others speaking up and standing up for a change, Congress finally acted about a year later and passed a law that protects coal miners. And this law has passed, excuse me, this law has saved literally 100,000 or more people's lives since its enactment. It's been revised slightly a couple of times, but miners no longer have to go to work without the protection of their United States government. And we've been active in trying to preserve that law and improve that law over the many, many years it's been in place. So we should take this moment you know, once again to recognize those family members uh, that were became activists almost overnight and demanded that their government act. In addition to passing health and safety laws, we enacted as part of that legislation the recognition that pneumoconiosis, or as we've all know, the, the, the term black lung, was part of that legislation that was passed, and hundreds of thousands of people have benefited from this. Up until that point in time, our government never recognized black lung as an occupational illness. So we owe so many uh, things. So we owe so much to these uh, workers who, who perished. We repeatedly call them heroes who were the first ones uh, up the hill, so to speak, and if it was a war, but they gave their lives, but they did not die in vain. Their families gave so much, not only losing them, but giving so much back to all of us uh, throughout the coal fields so that the mines would be safer. And also people choking to death on black cloth, that they would be compensated for that illness. So, uh, this is not the way we'd like to do things, but we are here saying thank you to those people who went before us. We're recognizing them again as heroes. We're thanking uh, once again the family members, particularly the widows who took up the fight. And we should also remember those who supported us. And I'm proud to say uh, that our union over the past many years, we did not do so at the time of this explosion but we have been uh, there fighting to keep their names and, and remembrance. We've been fighting to keep federal black lung laws. We've been fighting to keep health and safety laws for many, many years now. And that's what we do in our union. So once again, the United Mine Workers of America honors those who perished and those who fought afterwards and those who fight every single day. Thank you and may God bless all of you. At this time, we will be placing three wreaths. There will be one placed on behalf of the families, one placed on behalf of all the locals, one placed for the international and the district. Amazing on behalf of the United Mine Workers of America International Union in District 31, I would ask Vice President Meredith, Mike Caputo, to join me in placing of the brief. On behalf of the victims, all the families and the survivors of this tragic event, I would ask John Tooth and Tom Anderson to please place the wreaths at this time. On behalf of all locals in District 31, I would ask John Palmer and Adam Fry to please come up and place the wreaths.
I'd like to introduce to you Tom Brighting. Tom Brighting has Tom Brighting has been a mainstay ever since the struggle with the Patriot bankruptcy. He's inspired people all across the, the labor movement with his music. I asked about if he would consider writing a song about the number nine. And at this point in time, we'd like to play that song for you in tribute. Please welcome Tom Bright. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm proud to be with you today to remember the 78 who died and their family and their friends everywhere. Morning in November, year of 68. A blast blew out Llewellyn, and the ground began to shake in the mine. Number nine. Twenty-one found freedom from the fires beneath the ground. Ten long years for others. Nineteen were never found in the mine. Number nine. And there were tears of joy for those whose lives were spared. And prayers for their brothers remaining there in the mine. Number nine. And for nine days and nights, those fires went on to burn. Ten mornings later, this news their families learned. They've sealed the mine. Number nine. In the year that followed, the survivors organized a team to find the bodies of the brothers where they lie in the mine. Number nine. And they opened up the slope in the fall of 69. And those brothers of the fallen they were the first to walk inside, inside that mine. Number Then before you know it, well, they were back to mining coal and digging for the bodies of every living soul who died in the mine. Number nine. And after nine more years of mining, all but 19 there were found. And to this very day, they remain under the ground in the mine. Number nine. And some never knew the peril fate held for them that day. And some were found together where they tried to walk away from the mine. Number I 
law was passed, a promise, they would not die in vain. A tragedy like Farmington would never be again. Like in the mine. Number nine. Where 21 found freedom from the fires beneath the ground. 59 uncovered, 19 never found in the mine. Number nine. 240 acres set aside where a statue bears the names of the 78 who died in that mine number nine. We will be posting a letter from Senator Joe Manchin. Senator Manchin is instrumental so that we have our health care, we have our pensions. Without Senator Manchin, where would we be? Senator Manchin has close ties with the disaster at the Farmington Number 9. So please take the time to read the letter from the Senator. And we thank you, Senator Manchin, for always being there for the United Mine Workers of America. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, ask Mike Caputo to come up and do the roll call. Mike is the Vice President Emeritus of District 31, and he is Senator-elect for the great state of West Virginia. Please welcome my computer. I'd like to take a moment to thank Vice President Altman for giving me the honor of reading the roll call of the 78 men that lost their lives in the number nine mine explosion on November 20th, 1968, of which 19, still remain in that mine. Arthur A. Anderson, Jr. Jack O. Armstrong. Thomas D. Ashcraft. Jimmy Barr. Orville D. Beam. John Joseph Bingaman. Thomas Bogus. Lewis S. Boros, Harold W. Butt, Lee E. Carpenter, David V. Cartwright, William E. Currents, Dale E. Davis, Albert R. DeBerry, Howard A. Deal, George O. Decker, James E. Efall, Joe Ferris, Virgil A. Pete Forte, Hillary Wade Foster, Alda G. Freeman, Jr., Robert L. Glover, Forrest B. Goff, John F. Guz, Charles F. Hartman, Ebert E. Hartzell, Simon P. Hayes, Paul F. Henderson, Roy F. Henderson, Sr., Steve Horvalt, Junior M. Jenkins, James Jones, Pete J. Kaznowski Sr., Robert D. Kearns, Charles E. King, James Ray Nicely, George R. Kovar, David Manila Sr., 
Walter R. Martin, Frank Matish, Hartzell L. Maley, Dennis N. McDonald, Emilio D. Magna, Jack D. Michael, Wayne R. Minor, Charles E. Moody, Paul O. Moran, Adrian W. Morris, Joseph Muto, Randall R. Parsons, Raymond R. Parsons, Nicholas Petro, Fred Burt Rogers, William D. Sheem, Robert J. Sigley, Henry J. Skarzynski, Russell D. Snyder, John Sopach, Jerry L. Stone King, Harry L. Strait, Albert Takis, William L. Takis, Dewey Tarley, Frank Tate Jr., Goy A. Taylor, Hoy B. Taylor, Edwin A. Tennant, Homer E. Titchener, Dennis L. Toller, John W. Toothman, Gordon H. Tremble, Roscoe M. Triplett, William T. Walker, James H. Walters, Lester B. Willard, Edward A. Williams, Lloyd William Wilson, Jerry R. Unero. Let's have a moment of silence for our fallen brothers. Thank you. I'd like to bring up Jack Reinhardt. Jack Reinhardt is a member of Local 1702. Jack has prayed for the mine workers for many years. Jack is a man of God and faith, and he has helped us through many, many hard times. At this time, I would like for you to welcome, please, Jack Reinhardt. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that we come in remembrance of these men. These men who are heroes, Lord, we ask you to be with them. You lead God and direct them. But Father, I ask you to be the families now, some 50 some odd years later, that you strengthen them and bless them also, Lord, because they are they were wives and grandmothers and grandfathers and fathers and great grandchildren now, Lord, has come. But Father, most of all, I ask you to be with the one who brought us here, Lord. The Jesus that went to the cross, Lord, the Jesus that hung on the cross on the third day, he rose from the dead, Lord, and there's no other way but accept him, Lord, and live eternity, and someday we will meet those men again, Lord, in your home. When we enter that place, Lord, they'll be waiting at the gate for us and their families and their wives and each and every one of us to spend an eternity in complete rest. Today, I ask these things in the name of the risen Savior, in Jesus' most precious name, amen. At this time, we're going to close the ceremony with a rifle salute and taps. I want you to know from all of us how much we love everybody that comes to this. You're truly our family. And we hope and pray that this time next year, we will be together as a family and in celebration and paying homage to the 78 miners and the 19 that are still trapped inside. So until next year, be careful and God bless.
This concludes our ceremony, but please keep our keep your family and your loved ones safe from harm in these trying times. And we will see you again next year. <laughs>